Let's continue our study in the book of Revelation, chapter 18. Go ahead and read up from the point of where we last left off in Revelation, chapter 18. Revelation, chapter 18, verse 1, it says, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not her plagues. Verse 5, For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquity. So this is where we're at, we're at verse 5. It says, so speaking of uh, Babylon, it says, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. All right, so we see it says, for her sins have reached unto heaven. So sins, of course, are plural, but when it says have reached unto heaven, then it gives us this visual image or picture, imagery, and that her sins are so great, right? They are so, so, and so great, and so many that they have piled up so high that it reaches unto heaven. And that's that's the uh, imagery that we are uh, given here, that her sins are so great and they are so many. Remember, she's a great city as well. Right? With all these people and with all these demons that are there, you can imagine how much sin, right? How many sins and how great amount of sin and, and great level and depths of sin is being um uh, performed here in Babylon, so much that it's piled so high that it reached unto unto heaven, right? Even reaching up unto God, right? That there are just so many. And it goes on here and it says, uh, and God hath remembered her iniquity, right? But going back to her sins have reached unto heaven, right? This lets us know that there is both growth and depth of the city of Babylon the great and sin. So there is a, from when it first started as the Tower of Babel, all the way up to when it became Babylon and then Babylon the Great, right? There is this continual growth and depth of the city, Babylon the Great in sin. And that's the image and picture that we're seeing here, right? And so now this is in contrast to another city. There is, you know, we talked about this before. There is two cities that are called uh, the great city, right? Uh, one is the great city, Babylon. The other one is the great city or that great city to calls it, which is above New Jerusalem, right? And so both of these cities are growing in growth and in depth, right? New Jerusalem is growing in growth and in depth as well. We are growing, growing in the Lord, growing in the knowledge of the Lord, growing in the capability of walking in his love and in his righteousness and his peace and mercy and in his good works and good will. Uh, gathering and guarding his good favor. But at the same time, there is another city that's also growing in depth as well. And that's the city of Babylon, right? But they're growing in sin. They're growing greater in their iniquities. And so both of us are growing, right? Um, we may not seem or feel like we're growing, but we're as, iniqu as Babylon the Great is growing in its depth and knowledge of sin, Right, we are growing in the depth and and the knowledge and the growth of Jesus Christ, right, and His will for us and His plan for us and His purpose for us. We are growing in that as well, and we are the New Jerusalem, that great city which is above, right. But here, in this instance, we're seeing Babylon the Great. Its growth and depth and knowledge of its sin is growing and growing and increasing that is so high that it's piled up unto heaven and God has remembered her iniquities. When it says God has remembered her iniquities, it's talking about he has all these sins that she's done. He is rehearsing, he's recalling to memory all of these things for the purpose of punishing her adequately, for gathering up his fury and his wrath so that he can execute the righteous judgment based on the volume of her sin, as he calls to remembrance and all the things that she's done, all how she's persecuted the saints and the blood of the prophets is in her as well, right? And how she, all that are slain of the earth, it says, 
are a result of Babylon. She is the cause of all that are slain upon the earth. So he's remembering and all these other iniquities and how it's so great and just increasing and proliferating and growing throughout the whole world and the whole earth and all the way up to heaven. He's remembering all these things. And so both, uh, it says sins, her sins are plural. We know they are great and many. And it says remembering her iniquities. And of course, those iniquities there, that is both plural as well. And that's part of the great uh, Babylon. We um, both, all these demons that are present is there as well. And they're the ones that are helping just kind of foment even more of this growth and depth of the sin and iniquities. And God recalls all of that, rehearses all of that. Uh, for the purpose of punishment. Verse six, it says, reward her even as she rewarded you and double unto her double according to her works. And the cup which she had filled, filled to her double. So we've gone to go over this before, right? Uh, it speaks about reward her even as she rewarded you. So reward, when you think of reward, you kind of think of something that's, that's just good, you know? But here it's talking about, it's a, it's a payment for, for deeds, right? For all of the deeds that she's done, give her payment for, for her deeds, right? She has um, done evil things toward the saints, right? So she's, he's going to, God's going to pay her what is worthy of the evil deeds that she has done. And so she's done evil, evil's going to be given back for her. One of the things we were looking at Revelation chapter uh, 15 and 16 uh, it was evil for evil. God is going to give, render evil for the evil, pain uh, for the amount of evil that they did. He's going to reward or get payment for the deeds of the evil that they have done. Right. Um, just as Babylon, as we know, it says here that reward her even as she rewarded you. Right. So this lets us know then that Babylon, the purpose of what Babylon is trying to do is that she has been rewarding right? Well, falsely rewarding. She's been rewarding the saints. She's been, re because saints have been doing good deeds, she's been paying those saints with evil deeds, right? So she's been paying out evil for good, but God's going to pay, pay, pour out evil for her evil, right? And so uh, everything that we see Babylon is doing, what she's trying to do is she's trying to bring punishment, right, against the saints. And that's what her whole purpose is. A lot of what we talked about this before, it's, I know it's a, a repeating, a broken record here. A lot of stuff that's what's going on in the world, it's maneuvering and positioning itself ultimately to try to bring stress and sorrow and persecution on the body of Christ, on church, on, on the believers, right? Trying to wreak havoc on the people of God, trying to disrupt the things of God. Um, you know, all these things that are going on in the world right now, that's, that's what... That's the maneuvering that's going on. Of course, the plan is also to continue to prepare this world to be ready to accept the Antichrist, pulling everything down or people just ready to just um, uh, looking for this leader that's going to come to make their lives better. But he's only going to it's only going to make it worse. All right. So she gave Babylon gave the saints torment and sorrow. That's all she's about getting the, the church uh, torment and sorrow. And so the Lord is going to repay her for what she has rewarded unto us, right? Uh, and it says, the cup which she has filled, filled to her double. We talked about this before. She doubled down on giving the saints, uh, persecuting the saints and punishing the saints and bringing sorrow and torment to us. She doubled down on that. And so the Lord's going to pay double to her double, right? And that is the law of God when it comes to judgment, that there must be a, a doubling in order to um recompense or bring justice righteous judgment is a doubling of the punishment so that's what's going on here the double judgment principle all right now verse seven it says how much has she glorified herself and lived deliciously so much torment and sorrow give her for she hath said in her heart i sit a queen and i am no widow and see no sorrow this is quite unique here this woman here babylon says she glorified herself and this word glorifying herself means that she magnifies herself. She exalts herself. She lifts herself up. Uh, she sees herself being full of glory. She promotes herself as being full of glory and full of honor. This lets us know that she does not seek the glory that comes from God and is given by God. She's not seeking that glory. The glory that she has is a different kind of glory. There is a glory that is of this world system, a Babylon system. 
And that was what uh, uh, Satan was offering up to Jesus. He said, I'll give you all the, the glory of all the kingdoms and stuff like that. I'll give you Babylon. You know, I'll make you uh, sit as a queen as well. And I'll give you all this glory. Right. But it's not the glory that comes from God. Now, another thing that this phrase is saying, she glorified herself. It also means that she worships herself as deity. Right. And I'm going to show you uh, some, some Old Testament scriptures that show you that she presents herself as a deity. Well, as God, actually, we're going to hear her say something that she she, call, she calls herself. I am right. Uh, which means, you know, I mean, that's what God that's what God says, you know. I am, you know, that she feels that that she is the existence of all things and nothing, everything exists because of her and by her and through her, right? Um, beginning of all things, stuff like that. She was from the beginning, right, in the Tower of Babel, going all the way back um, uh, to the time of the Old Testament and Genesis, stuff like that. Um, but of course, the Father and the Son existed even before the creation and the foundation of the world. But she worships herself as deity, and we're going to look at that. When she says she glorifies glorifies herself, she's showing that she does not have a need for a Savior. She does not promote any other salvation other than what is in herself through the, self, through the luxuries that she has, that in her riches and in her wealth and in her abundance and her political power and connections, or connections with Satan, Right. And all of that is all the salvation that you need. And that's what the world teaches. Why do you need that, Jesus? That's that's phony. That's weak. That's for weak people. There's nothing in that. But in the world, it has everything that you need for salvation. You know, trust in riches, trust in wealth, trust in your castles and your big fortified homes with your security cameras and, you know, your floodlights on the outside and your, you know, your padlocks and double boat locks. Trust in all of that stuff, your bank account, your 401ks, you know, trust in that. That's your salvation. That's your safety. That's your provision. It's what Babylon provides. It's its own uh, spiritual religious system that provides salvation. And many trust in it, put all their trust in education and connections and money and uh, organizations and things like that. Right? And they worship it. They worship the system which represents Babylon. And it says, uh, for she hath glorified herself. How much has she glorified, how much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. So this word deliciously just means um, she just, she has, she has a life that she enjoys, a life of luxury, right? You know, um, and that's what Babylon glorifies and worships, luxury. Everybody worships the luxurious things, worship it, you know, a worship seeing uh, celebrities uh, with all of their gowns on and cost thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars with diamonds and jewels or cars and all these things, just, you know, just luxury, right? Enjoy a life of luxury. And that's, that's what the world offers as part of their religious system is a life of luxury. If you come part of this Babylonian spiritual fornication, false idolatry and worship of false God system, you come a part of that, you will, be, uh, an, an avenue will be opened up for you to enjoy a life of luxury. So Babylon praises um, and worships luxury and indulgence. And the world does that. You look at you, ah, oh, you know, lifestyles of the rich and famous or money, wealth, greed, power, fame, right? And that's what Babylon uses to lure men, to deceive men, to dis to seduce individuals into spiritual fornication and their own death and destruction, right? But we see the opposite of what Christ off offers us, right? what Christ offers us, right? The religious spiritual system that we have in Christ, right? He offers us our salvation, right? Is predicated on crucifying the flesh and the lusts and affections thereof, right? It's completely opposite to what Babylon is. And so, uh, that's in order to be separate, separate ourselves from Babylon, that's what we have to do, right? In order to uh, go the way of Christ, right? The way of Christ is, you know, deny your, uh, crucify the flesh, take up your cross and follow me, you know, go outside the gates, right? Uh, and put away sin, right? So that we may enter into Jerusalem. Now, that is new Jerusalem he's talking about here, right? So it says here, she lives deliciously. Right, and says, so much torment and sorrow give her. Why does he, this phrase here is saying, how much she has glorified herself and lived deliciously. 
so much torment and sorrow give her. So he's saying she's, she's, she sees herself as deity. Uh, she promotes and worships and prays and lures others with all of her luxuries that she has and delicacies, right? Um, but that's not the only reason why she is to be judged and tormented and persecuted. The scripture here says another reason why she's going to be judged and tormented and persecuted, right? It says so much torment and sorrow give her and it has a, semi, has a colon here. And, and it says, because she said in her heart, I sit a queen, I am no widow and shall see no sorrow. She actually uh, like blasphemes herself against God. Just like, I can commit all these sins, do all these wrongs. I can make myself a deity and no one is going to dethrone me. No one can dethrone me. You know, I will be established forever. I will see no, you know, I, I am no widow. You know, I will see no, no sorrow, no death will come around me or near me and stuff like that. And so because of that, she says this in her heart. That's the wickedness that is in her heart. But I said, I said as a queen. Right. And so when you look at this word, I sit as a queen. Now, a queen can be both um, uh, a ruler and it can be a consort. That's a, a fancy word of saying a wife. Right. Um, when you're a queen, you use more than just a wife when you're a queen, you know, uh, what they call like a cons consort. In the Bible, Esther, uh, Leah's favorite, uh, biblical, one of her favorite biblical characters, she was a consort to a uh, king. Right. The other thing about the queen is that she also is a ruler. She ha she rules over a king, a kingdom. Right. Now in the Bible, there's only one queen. That was the queen of Judah. Her name was uh, Athaliah. Right. Rarely known fact or whatever. I just kind of just threw through that in there. But this queen here, Queen Babylon, she is both. She is both. She is both uh, a ruler. And she is a consort or a wife or something like that. And we know that when we see the, how she's been described. As a ruler, we know she's a ruler as a queen because she, she reigns over the kings and kingdoms of the earth. And um, right, so that, that means that she actually has authority and power and she is reigning and she is ruling and she is dominating. The group says she sits over and reigns over the kings of the earth. So this, she's powerful. Right. And so that's what she's saying. She said in her heart, I sit as a queen. So she's saying, I'm powerful. I rule and I reign. I have authority. Right. No one can displace my power. There is no greater power or authority is what she's saying. Of course, that's blasphemy because, I mean, there's God the Father. I mean, there's the Son. But she's like, she's saying, no, I'm a ruler. I have power and authority. I reign and rule. No one's going to move me from out of my place. Right. And so because she says these things like that, God is like, I will give you much torment and much sorrow for that blasphemy. Not just enough that she glorified herself as a deity. Right. Um, but also because in her heart, she's like, nobody can replace me. Nobody can usurp my authority and things like that. Now, and the other thing that she says, I am no widow. Right. Um, the other part of a queen is that she's a, a, a wife or a consort. And that is kind of conveyed when you hear the phrases that she commits spiritual fornication with kings, with the kings of the earth, right? So it's showing that she's not just um, a, 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 a feminine figure as a counterpart to a king, right? Um, or just as a ruler dominating. She uh, is fully, she is, co she is reigning or fulfilling the full meaning of what this word, I sit as a queen. Right. She is intimately involved with spiritual fornication with all the kings of the earth. And ultimately, we know that she is actually involved with even with the eighth king. Right. The eighth king is actually Satan. She goes and she sits on the beast. Right. Right. And in that sense, she's saying, I am no widow. Like she feels that all the kings of the earth, right, she's going to always have them to her. And that she's always going to even be bond, bound to Satan. And Satan's going to always be giving him or uh, her his authority and power to reign and to rule and to dominate over the earth the way she's uh the way that she has done babylon is doing babylon works through sorcery uh and demons and spirits that are given to her uh by satan and satan is the eighth king that we talked about before so it talks about uh she's a queen uh the wife or the consort of kings is both of uh, the kings of the earth and also satan as well as the eighth king uh because she sits on the beast 
right? Um, what's that? Oh, my wife is correcting uh, my pronunciation. She's good at that uh, uh, because I'm always just embarrassing myself. Uh, she says it is uh, Athalia. Is that correct? Athalia. That is uh, the only queen of Judah. No, there is no other queen that uh, reigned. Everything else was just uh, kings. Right. Um, here she says, I sit as a queen. I am no widow. I shall see no sorrow. Right. Now, this is a unique phrase. I am no widow. I shall see and shall see no sorrow. This is in contrast to Israel, a, another spiritual um, woman. Uh, Israel is described as a woman that is married to God. And it's almost kind of like a, uh, like a mocking because Israel was described as being both widowed and divorced from God mm -hmm. and saw much sorrow, you know, sees much sorrow. Israel, because of their uh, idolatry and rebellion or rejection of God, rejection of Christ, right? Uh, they have been separated from God. God has separated himself from them only, only temporarily, right? And uh, Christ has even spoken of that they're going to see much sorrow because of how they've rejected Christ and how they've always rejected the word. They've always seen much sorrow. But Babylon says, oh, I'm no widow and I shall see no sorrow. I, I will always be bound uh, to the kings of the earth, bound to Satan, and I'm going to always be supported. I uh, will always have many lovers. They're always going to be worshiping me and promoting me and, and, and exalting me, and I will never see any sorrow. And the world tries tries to tries to show that the spirit of Babylon in this world. Um, they try to show Christianity as well uh, as being filled with sorrow, abandoned by God. There is no God, Babylon says, the spirit of this world system. Says, oh, there's no God, God. You guys are worshiping, serving a God that does not exist. Show us God. Show us this. You're widowed. You know, uh, you see star, look at your lives. Why would you serve a God that you guys are just suffering and miserable when you could be living it up and partying? You guys are just pathetic or whatever, right? That's how the world always tries to portray, uh, portray us. But that's not, that's not correct. Right, Babylon is a world system that believes it will continue forever. She says, I am no widow and shall see no sorrow. Right. So because she says all of this, right, all this blasphemy that's going up before God, that's part of the of the of the many sins and iniquities that have gone up to heaven. This is part of that, right? How she just boasts herself before God. Right. So he says, Therefore, give her torment and sorrow. Now, Isaiah chapter 47, verse 8 through 10. Uh, is the parallel scripture to what we're reading in Revelation chapter 18. Uh, I try not to read too much of the Old Testament stuff, but I do know a lot of people have not read a lot of the Old Testament. So for those that have not, I try to go in and pull some of these things out. It's amazing about the Bible is that if you try to go into the Bible, I remember this one time I was uh, out doing some uh, witnessing and ministering on uh, University of Florida campus, right? And people were telling, saying stuff like, um, Oh, the Bible is written by man. It's not true. And stuff like that. And I asked them, all right, well, what part of the Bible do you think is not true? You give them the Bible and they will tear it out. You know, tear a page out that you think is not true, whatever. You know, tear it out. All right. Uh, which page you want to have torn out? And so, you know, they'll tear this. I want to tear this page out, whatever. And you can show them that, okay, what's on this page right here, right? In the New Testament. They always want to tear something in the New Testament, whatever. All right. Uh, you tell them to tear out what page you want to tear out. Right, they say, I want to tear this page out, whatever. And you read, scan it, whatever. And you go into the Old Testament and you can find the same verses that is in the, the New Testament. Go flip back into the Old Testament and say, well, here it is right here. It shows the consistency of the word of God, which was written, you know, uh, thousands of years before the New Testament was even written to show that, oh, this isn't just uh, some made up stuff here. These are prophecies that were written well before um, uh, the New Testament was written as well. So they both kind of support uh, each other. So you can rip out, even if you only had a couple uh, chapters in the Bible, we only had the Old Testament or whatever, um, you can, the word of God, the way the Holy Spirit has divided up the scriptures and separated out through numerous prophets and stuff like that, you can get, if you just had just a few chapters of the Old Testament, a few chapters of the New Testament, you can really get a good picture of all the things 
of of the word of God. You know, you, you can get a good picture of it and be able to preach and teach the gospel, as a matter of fact. Uh, but anyway, uh, parallel scripture to this about the the judgment and the description that Babylon speaks of herself is in Isaiah chapter 47, verse 8 through 10. I'm just going to kind of uh, kind of go through it kind of quickly and you'll be able to see some of these things here. It says, therefore, hear now this, thou that art given to pleasures. So Babylon is all about pleasure. So we have to be very cautious about a life of pleasures. Here it says, she lived deliciously. We're not living after the flesh and after the lust and affection and the passion. That's Babylon. We're not doing that. We are having our senses um, uh, honed in, cut back, crucifying the flesh so that we're not caught up into the into Babylon. It says that dwelleth carelessly. So she lives freely, just whatever she wants to do, not without any real thought or purpose, just living from day to day, moment to moment, with, without a care or plan for her life or for life, right? That is not how we want to live our lives, right? We want to think about our life and how we live our life out. And that there's a meaning and a purpose and an end to our life and our soul must be accounted for. And she says, here it goes on, it says, um, that saith in thy heart, I am, and none else besides me. I shall, I shall not sit as a widow, neither shall I know the loss of children. So we can read, we can tell just from reading this passage right here that this is a parallel scripture of Revelation chapter 18, speaking of Babylon, how she glorifies herself. So here we see where she says, she, uh, that saith in thy heart, I am. So that's where I'm getting the phrase that when this scripture here says how much she glorifies herself, she is actually worshiping herself as deity. She magnifies herself as deity. Babylon, it causes people to magnify themselves as deity, as God. I'm the captain of my own soul, the master of my own fate. Nobody can tell me what to do. I have my own truth. I have my own way. I make my own decisions. You know, deity, self-deification is what's happening, is what Babylon does, right? That you don't even recognize any other God or you don't recognize the God that you want, but you don't recognize the true and living God. You create you, and, and now we're there, everyone's at the point where they feel that they are deity, they are gods, right? And that's what we're seeing. So here she says, in thy heart, I am. Now that is blasphemy, right? Because we know that when Moses was at the burning bush, right? And the phrase was, I am, <laughs> you know? But here she calls herself, I am, right? So that's, Babylon is all about self-deification, making yourself a god. And that, right? Is what it says, so much torment and sorrow give her, colon, for she hath said all these things like, I am. And for God, that's like, ooh, don't do that. And, and it goes on to say, and none else besides me, right? That is the exact thing that we know that God says, like, there is no other God besides me. And that's what she says, I am, none else besides me. It's like, what? So because of it, he's like, ooh, so much torment, so much sorrow give her. Right. And that's what's going on in the world. The world is in the Babylonian spirit is causing them to see themselves as deity. And we know that because when the anti all of this is preparing the stage for the Antichrist, when the Antichrist comes along, he says the same thing. He calls, he declares himself to be God and he doesn't want anyone else to be worshipped but him as well. Right. And so here we have the ba Babylonian system or Babylon. It's sitting on the beast. It's just carrying, preparing people and ushering them to receive the, the, the true and final um, Antichrist. And he's going to say the same thing. I am and there's none else beside me and declare that everyone worship him as well. Babylon wants everyone to worship her as deity. right? And that's what she's trying to push everybody just to worship her. And she has many ways of presenting it, of you worshiping her indirectly through all different types of things through things, you know, through lust, through pleasure, through passion, you're actually, that, they, that becomes deity, you, you, and you become a part of that, you know. It says, none else beside me. And she says, I shall not sit, I'm reading Isaiah chapter 47, verse 8, continue on, it says, I shall not sit as a widow, neither shall I know the loss of children. Verse 8, just to keep moving here. But these two things shall come to thee in a moment, and one day the loss of children and widowhood 
They shall come upon thee and their perfection for the multitude of thy sorceries and for the great abundance of thy enchantment, enchantments. So here we see the thing about her is that uh, about Babylon, she de deifies herself and says, there is no other God but me. So she won't allow the true and living God. She's actually rejecting the true and living God by using this phrase. And she, there's all kinds of deities, but the one deity, the true and living God, the true deity, she does not permit and she replaces it for herself. So Babylon is the, is the forerunner or is the antichrist spirit that is putting everything into place for the antichrist to step up and say, re replacement of Christ. The Babylon spirit there is like the holding position by, by, by Babylon saying, well, I am. I am God. There's none else beside me. And then won't allow anyone else to worship the true and living God. That's why she persecutes the saints, right? And kills the blood uh, and kills the prophets, right? And, and rebels against God. She stands as, as God and fights against the true and living God, replaces God, the true and living God, and has wants everybody to worship her as the true and living God and says, there's no other true and living God beside me. But yet at the same time, permits uh, the worship of false gods and idolatry, all right? Uh, and, but she also participates, it says here in verse nine, Isaiah chapter 47, participates in a multitude of sorceries and a great abundance of enchantment. So she is casting spells on people, right? Babylon is all about casting spells and sorceries on people to draw them away from the true and living God so they can't see the true and living God and they see God in the in the in the pleasures and the lusts uh, and in the wealth of this and the and the and, and the idolatry and the spiritual fornication of this world, they see that as deity because she replaces that right. And that's what we see going on in the world more and more today in the schools now and in the educational system. Uh, we even starting to see a lot even in the church world as well. Right? And the last church, the last of the. Uh, seven churches of the church age dispensation, that last church, the Laodicean church, basically is the Babylonian church. She says the same thing. I'm wealthy. I'm rich. You know, God is, Christ is on the outside, you know, and she's worshiping and having church. And they're like, how are you worshiping and having church with Jesus and God on the outside? That's Babylon, right? They replace God and, and, and luxury and wealth and money and gold and stuff like that. That becomes deity. That becomes God, right? And they worship the Babylonian system of pleasure and, and luxury and wealth. And that's what we see a lot going on in the church today is what we're calling uh, part of the falling away. All right. Just to finish up here a little bit, Isaiah chapter 47, verse uh, 10, it says, But thou hast trusted in thy wickedness, and thou hast said, None seeth me. All right. So the thing about Babylon, one of the things that she says, which is, I sit as a queen, I am no widow and shall see no sorrow. Right, she is trusting in thy in, in her wickedness. It's thou is trusting the wickedness. Like, man, I'm so wicked, I can get around, get over, and get through anything that tries to come around me. And that's what a lot of people are trying to do. They're trying to fight against Babylon in, in the flesh. But she trusts in her wickedness. And so a lot of people are getting caught up, you know, in politics, whatever, and they're trying to fight against the evil of one political system in the same manner that they're fighting in whatever, but you can't fight violence with violence. You can't protest with protests. You can't, you know, she is full of wickedness and she trusts in this wickedness and it is capable, right? And you will try, if you try to fight the way she fights you, you will not win, right? She trusts in her wickedness and she has cast enchantments and she has sorceries. You can't fight against this, this, this demonic system of Babylon in the natural. You, it, it has to be spiritual and, and God and, and Christ, right? Uh, it says, thy wisdom and thy knowledge, it hath perverted thee. And thou hast said in thine heart, I am and none else beside me. Again, it repeats over and over. We see this thing about Babylon, right? Uh, the great whore, the great city is that she keeps saying, I am and none else beside me, right? It's blasphemy blasphemy just over and over she just keeps promoting right uh it is through her wickedness her enchantment her wisdom and her knowledge that she's able to offer up and present that there's none i am i am it look at what the wisdom that i have the capabilities that i have right the wickedness if you try to fight against me my wickedness will prevail and overcome you if you try to fight me right especially in the, um 
uh, in 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 the flesh through through natural means, you will come up saying, "Man, wow, she is must be you know undefeatable, right? She must be deity. You try to fight against her, she will win every time, right?" And she'll say, there's, "And there's none else beside me." She will continue to prove herself to be that way, right? Until she comes up, of course, against the believers, right? Um, she, you know, tried to throw the three Hebrew boys into the furnace fire, right? And they were overcome. Daniel was able to overcome things like that. So when she comes up against, uh, those, uh, who serve God, right? Of course, then, um, uh, we are, they are victorious. Verse 11, therefore shall no evil come un upon me. Thou shalt not know from, therefore shall evil come upon thee. Thou shalt not know from whence it riseth and mischief shall fall upon thee. Thou shalt not be able to put it off, and desolation shall come upon thee suddenly, which thou shalt not know. So we were talking about this phrase, um, um, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. One of the things that we said when you see something that occurs twice is that it is certain and it is sudden. Sudden. Right? So here we see that phrase where it says, desolation shall come upon thee suddenly. Right? It is certain. Right? Uh, thou shalt not be able to put it off. Right? It's, it, it is certain. And desolation should come upon thee suddenly, right? And so when you see the one of the things about when you're talking about judgment, and something is mentioned twice, it's talking about it's, it's sudden and certain, right? As well as when it's judgment against sin and things like that or wrongdoing, it's a doubling as well. So we just want to just kind of show you how we come up with um, uh, how we come up with with these interpretations, things like that. Verse twelve, it says. Stand now with thine enchantments and with thy with the multitude of thy sorceries, wherein thou hast labored from thy youth, if so be thou shalt be able to profit, if so be thou mayest prevail. So it's the challenge. God is now challenging back. He says, All right, you said there's none beside me. Um uh, I am, there's none beside me. I, I sit as a queen, as a ruler, right? Uh, and I shall see no sorrow. He says, All right. Uh, mano a mano, uh, deity to deity or false deity to true and living God, right? Use all your enchantments, all your wisdom and knowledge that you have in the occults and in the sorceries and witchcraft and see if you prevail. You've grown up in it from your youth. And now you become great. This great city of Babylon filled with iniquity and sin and demons and stuff like that. Can you fight against the true and living God? Can you prevail? He's saying, you know, try it. Of course, we know uh, Babylon does not fall. She falls suddenly and in one hour. All right. Uh, verse 8. It says, Therefore shall her plagues come in one day. Revelation chapter 18, verse 8. Death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. So it is God who judges. God and Christ bring judgment upon Babylon. And it says it's going to come sudden and in one day. Boom, that's the part of the sudden we're talking about here. So others, it says in one hour, right? We speak of our, we're talking about the uh, judgment. And the judgments are the plagues that's going to come upon her. It says, therefore, her plagues shall come one day. The plagues or judgment that we're talking about here is death, mourning, sorrow, and famine, right? Those are the things uh, that she bragged and said, oh, I shall see, you know, I, I, I am no widow, that there's going to be no death around me, right? Um, and she lived deliciously, right? That's where the famine is coming at, you know, that all the things that she likes, everything's going to be stripped away, right? She says, I see no sorrow. So he's going to give her sorrow and going to give her mourning, right? And so these are the things that uh, are going to be put upon, uh, as part of the judgment that's going to be brought upon um, Babylon. All right, verse 9, it says, And the kings of the earth, who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her, shall bewail her and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning. Now, it says, The kings of the earth, who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her, shall bewail her. Now, these are not those 10 kings that we talked about before. There are 10 kings that are that are going to move into place before the Antichrist come. And their desire, we read, is they have the same mind, same will, same purpose, is to uh, deliver the world over to the authority of the Antichrist. These are not these kings here. These are the other kings of the earth, because the, the 10 kings uh, that is part of the beast system 
Right? They only worship Satan and worship him in his purity. Uh, but not these kings here that are called the kings of the earth, right? So they're the ones that are going to be bewailing her, right? For those who are like, you know, I thought the ten kings, you know, they hated her. Why are they crying for her? These are two separate groups of kings that we're talking about here. And this word shall bewail her means that means they're going to sob and they're going to cry aloud, you know, to see her just be destroyed and burned down, torn, you know, everything just stripped from her, right? Uh, and we're we're going to be uh, beginning to enter into that process as well. A lot of what's going on in the world uh, is a tearing down of this system that many have become accustomed to, this Babylonian system here. There's a time coming, we see already with the escalating prices of food and um, gas and stuff like that. Um, it's the beginning of a process in which everything is going to be pulled down, just going to be pulled down. And everything is being maneuvered and positioned that way as well, uh, that the system is just going to be pulled down completely. And only those who have their faith in God, and God is with them, and they know their God, will they be able to survive it. But this is the final and ultimate destruction of Babylon that we're talking about here. But there's going to be a progress, always this progressive process of what we're talking about here. It uh, occurs in uh, progressive stages. But are they going to be well heard? Means they're going to sob and they're going to cry aloud. And so they're going to uh, they're going to lament for her as well. Lamenting is like you're beating on your chest pounding your chest in grief it's like great sorrow that you're having and then having great sorrow because it's the end of the babylonian system but they don't know that it's actually is the rise of the antichrist system and worship of, of, of a new uh worship system which is directly uh, worship of satan right so one system is being pulled away and thrown away right but it needed to be judged for all the evil things that she's done but then there's going to be a moving in a rise of the antichrist full antichrist system with the worship of the antichrist and um, and the worship of Satan is moving in, into place. Now we're talking about here that they're going, the kings of the earth are going to be well her and they're going to lament her when they see the smoke of her burning. Now other scriptures talk about uh, the smoke of the burning of Babylon when she is judged. In Revelation chapter 19 verse 3, it talks about uh, when she is destroyed, uh, her smoke rose up forever and forever. And what this is talking about here, I think I mentioned this before, it's not. It's talking about both an, uh, a natural destruction, but it's also the judgment that is coming upon her is spiritual as well. So there is both a uh, a natural destruction and all of the luxuries, and there's going to be there's going to be death. All of that, a lot of people that that are associated in Babylon, there's going to be death and destruction going to be associated with that, and the death and destruction of spiritual Babylon as well, but also physical death and destruction. There's going to be physical people mourning and having sorrow for her. Right? There's going to be literal physical famine as well. All the things that this system used to be able to offer is not going to be able to offer any of that stuff anymore. It's not going to be able to offer the life that comes with Babylon of living deliciously and just enjoying living life carelessly and carefree. Right, All that is both spiritual and natural as well. Right, But part of this smoke of her burning is both natural and spiritual as well. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 3, it shows the smoke of her burning as being a spiritual judgment as well and the spiritual judgment would say smoke burning up forever and ever that's talking about eternal continual judgment in the lake of fire right so uh babylonian system this whole babylonian system is run by demons and devils and there are individuals that are part of it as well both uh, part of you know mankind and earth they have put themselves in it as well and they are leaders of it as well. They're going to be destroyed as well as part of Babylon. And they're going to receive their judgment in the lake of fire forever and ever. It's going to be burning as well. So these are both a, a, a demonic and, and, and spirits that are associated with Babylon. And there are individuals that are promoting in a part of Babylon as well that, that keep it moving and going forward. And this the burning of the smoke is both natural and spiritual, continual, eternal judgment in the lake of fire. That's what's going to happen. Because you... Uh, you just can't cast Babylon, if you're just talking about it, just like a concept. You can't cast a, a concept into uh, the lake of fire where, be, where the smoke is going to rise up forever and ever. It's talking about all things that are involved in it, all the demons that are involved in it. Um, that God is going to destroy all of that, all those that are involved in that, the people, the system, the demons involved, going to be cast forever and going to be judged and punished forever and ever that are part of this system. Verse 10, I think I'm going to um, probably just stop right here. Um, 
but it says, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, verse 10, Revelation chapter 18, verse 10. So they're standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. Right, so they're standing afar off. And it says, why are, they, why are they standing afar off? Now, we haven't finished reading all of Revelation chapter 18, but basically it's not just the kings that are standing afar off. We're going to continue reading. We're going to find out it's the kings are standing afar off, the merchants are standing afar off, and the shipmasters all standing afar off. And they're standing afar off because of the fear of her torment. Now, when we talk about this word fear of torment, we're not just talking about um like natural torment, like, you know, like a tornado comes through and is ravaging everything and everything is spinning, cars are going through the air and you're just like screaming and yelling and torment as the windows are shaking, your house is shaking, whatever, right? Yes, it's talking about the natural torment as well, but it's, it's really talking about spiritual torment, right? It's the God, it's, it's the judgment of God and with it comes the punishment of everlasting destruction, like being cast into the lake of fire, Right. They whatever they're seeing, they know that this is this is from God and they're able to see um, this whole system like being. And I don't know how but seeing it being having an eternal judgment being cast upon them and being cast into the lake of fire. Right. Where the smoke is rising. Forever. They're able to see that. And there's a fear associated with like, oh, my God, this is God raining down an eternal judgment uh, that is ferocious or and spiritual that it's just destroying this thing and casting it into the lake of fire i don't know how you can look at something like that but that is what they're seeing and literally seeing like this whole system just being like gathered up destroyed burned down and cast into the lake of fire right they're they're seeing that and that's what it means for so standing for up for the fear of her torment it is there is the sight of the lake of fire the sight of the judgment of god that is eternal and everlasting destruction is tormenting, tormenting. The scriptures talk about when, uh, we're going to get to it in the book of Revelation. Um, took my time here. Um, Jesus talks about there's going to come a time when, when everybody's going to be standing before the white throne judgment and uh, people are going to be divided on the left. Uh, which are like the goats and, you know, the wicked sinners and those filled with iniquity. And on, on his right hand side, are going to be the saints. Um, and um, they're going to be judged before God. And then the angels are going to have to bind them up hand and foot. Right. And they're going to be there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's torment. That's the torment of eternal um, everlasting damnation, destruction, and separation, and being cast from the presence of God, from the presence of life, and being cast into the abyss of eternal darkness and the torture of demons and devils and stuff like that. And just God just eternally punishing forever and ever for all the sins that you've ever done. They're, these, the kings and merchants and shipmasters, they, they're able to see this, the eternal judgment of God happening before the true and final judgment of God that takes place where there's no more heaven, no more earth at all, consuming the flame of fire, and everybody's standing before God, you know, and, you know, people are bound and cast to the lake of fire. That's this torment that they're talking about, the fear for torment. Because that's the only, that's, that's the only real torment, you know. When the Bible talks about torment, you know, there's one thing, uh, I don't know, I don't get off topic, but Jesus talked about, um, hmm? um, Jesus talked about one man being, um, uh, being tormented, um, and uh, I think one person said, can I just get a piece of water and just, you know, dip the finger in water and, and, you know, and be cooled from it, whatever. And let me go warn people, whatever, but he was being tormented. And the scriptures talk about torment here, especially in the book of Revelation, but even in the old, in the New Testament, right? When Jesus talked about it, it's talking about a lake of fire and the judgment and, and, and the everlasting destruction, the eternal destruction and punishment that is going to continue forever and ever and ever. That's torment. And, and when people see that, right, you know, we may not be able to really see that yet, but these individuals during the Great Tribulation, they're going to see that torment. They're going to stand afar off. They said standing afar off. Like they got way off looking at that. And they saw that they moved far from the torment, right, that, uh, that the judgment that God poured out upon Babylon. Right. So that's what it's talking about here. This is a uh, cast from the presence of God and eternal damnation. They saw some torment here. Right. So anyway, it says, alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city for one hour is thy judgment come. Now, this phrase, alas, alas, again, alas, alas, is like 
the other phrase that we saw, which was, it's fallen, it's fallen, right? But alas is an Old Testament phrase. Well, well, it's an Old Testament phrase, but it is used in the Old Testament. It means woe. Uh, we've seen woe in the New Testament as well. We've seen the woe with the uh, last three trumpets, which were the locusts that had like um, uh, tails, uh, that had stings, uh, stings in them, and they would sting mankind and, and torture them, right? That came with wolves as well. They said there were three wolves and things like that, right? Uh, the other trumpet that had a woe with it was this innumerable army that came up out of the river Euphrates, and I think they had mouths of like lions that breathed fire, and they had a tail on it, and I think they went around stinging men as well, right? Um, right, and then the the the, the last woe. Uh, with that last trumpet was the last day judgment, woe, right? Uh, and so the phrase woes is associated with um, severe judgment, right? And so it, the word, when you look it up, it's an exclamation of grief and torment. So that word grief, when you look it up, it says grief and torment. And it means it's uh, um, it's associated with a judgment that is from God that is part of an e part of his eternal judgment, like uh, it's an ever, it's a type of everlasting judgment that is like it's like what you're going to experience, like when you're in hell. It's like it's a hell experience, right? And that's what it's like a glimpse of what the of what the torment that's in hell is like. They're going to experience it here on earth. I mean, I'm not going to hell. <laughs> it's not my desire to go to hell, um, but that's what this experience is like. There's there there these. Kings and merchants and shipmasters standing far off, they're, they're seeing a glimpse of what it's like to be tormented in hell, what's going to be like in hell. And what those last three trumpets with their three woes that come with each one of those judgments, that's an example of a grief and torment that's like what it's going to be like in hell, right? And the punishment is going to be forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. It's going to be like what's going on what these men are experiencing in these last three judgments here, or mankind's experiencing here. So alas, alas, this means woe. It means woe, woe. And again, it's a double alas or a double woe because it's a double judgment that is being poured out upon her, right? Now, we know that the Bible says, speaks of that the 10 kings are going to be responsible uh, for carrying out the destruction, part of the destruction of Babylon as well. So it's going to pay, play a role in the destruction of Babylon. The scripture talks about how the 10 kings we read before that she's going to make Babylon desolate. She's going to make her naked. She's going to eat her flesh and she's going to, they're going to burn her with fire. It says God has given it, put it in her heart and given it to the 10 kings to be able to fulfill that as part of his judgment as well. Right. But anyway, I'm going to stop there because my time is short. I don't want to uh, go go too much further uh, with that. But any comments or questions of what we've discussed so far? 